better than what I'm going to uh, present. But our task, our joint task, is uh, is to make it uh, better, and uh, we have all chances to do so. So let me uh, start uh, by presenting the thesis and the central message of my talk. talk. <clears throat> I think that uh, global and human rights race are facing an unprecedented emergency. And this is basically due to climate change and number of uh, interconnected issues. It's are related to energy use, economic growth, decisions on infrastructure and technology. And in my view, urgency is the key. Uh, we cannot anymore ignore the fact that decisions to change the world development been made now and not uh, five, 20 years from now. Uh, as people often say that we need uh, political will to make the really changes, but we have to have that political will right now. And I think coming uh, from the UN, sp uh, after spending like uh, 30 years uh, there, I think the UN is both the problem and the solution. And here I'm talking about problems in negotiations, in problems in UN's reports, and uh, and problems in integrated policy assessment. And in negotiations, and I'm now, although my background is in political science, and, 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 and these issues are now talking really on the sustainability and uh, climate change and related issues, which of course have a lot of to do with uh, political issues also. But here on negotiations, I'm saying that after 20 years of intensive talks of, of many sorts, the CO2, carbon dioxide emissions are just growing up. And there's something fundamentally wrong here. Secondly, the reports of the United Nations do not take this global emergency as a central message of the reports, but the various worrisome issues are scattered throughout the pages, but the interconnectedness of all these components are not really shown and made clear. The policy planning system of the UN, where I spent quite a lot of time in different capacities. You don't have any integrated system uh, dealing with uh, all kind of emergencies and their interconnections uh, uh, at, the, at the United Nations and, <coughs> and we should change that as soon as possible. So my the outline of my talk is that that I'm talking about and giving some evidence that the world is going through a major crisis and then what has been done and what should be done and then some conclusions. And there are, in my view, very four very big problems of humankind. First is the climate change, then energy and resources, and then interconnectedness between climate change and global energy use. This is an issue which has, has not reserved much attention. In general, uh, interconnected issues have not really uh, reached the mainstream of thinking. And then there we have a meta problem, which is the urgency, that what we do now will determine the global development path for decades and centuries to go. There are, of course, other issues like water, food crisis, population growth, financial crisis, and they are all related to these problems, but I'm not uh, going to discuss them today. So the first big problem is global climate change and warming of the planet and global CO2 
uh, another greenhouse emissions have continued without interruption. And here you see <coughs> global fuel and cement emissions, no sign of slowdown. There is a little uh, new evidence that uh, maybe last year there was a little stabilization uh, on the emissions. That would be a good sign and shows that uh, maybe some efforts uh, which we are doing to slow down this is, is having an impact. But it's so minor still compared to the problems that we should not uh, really uh, be too happy about that. Well, it's a good sign anyway. So here is uh, global fuel, fuel cement emissions, which are following the uh, uh, first part, which is this. Uh, this is coming from the <coughs> International Panel on Climate Change and their projections. This is the worst case, which is leading to uh, four to six Celsius increase in temperature compared to pre-industrial times, which is far too dangerous for human time and future human race. But that's what we are going at the present pace. <coughs> and this is the top emitting countries. And you see here that the US is decreasing, which is a good sign. European Union is decreasing. But then this with China, uh, it's very worrisome, bad. And also India, it's a upward trend. So this is a general uh, picture of the emissions. And if we go to the per capita emitters, we see that again US is decreasing. But you see also that, and then the China is increasing. But you see also this big difference showing how much kind of uh, responsibility Americans we all invest have for the uh, global uh, problem in this area. So another sub problem of global climate change is that Arctic and Antarctic are warming more rapidly than other parts of the world. And this will intensify the rise of the sea level in the future. And here you see global surface temperature changes from 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000. And you see this red uh, uh, really getting much uh, clearer, and, and that's a very certain trend. Here is a Arctic sea ice volume trends, accelerating melts. These are like the, uh, 12 each month of the year, which have a different path, but they are all going down. So in Arctic sea, the ice free, it could be ice free already this year, <coughs> and I three all year by 2030. And that's much uh, more worrisome than was earlier expected. So this is a Greenland ice sheet evidence of the ice, ice melt. And, uh, and of course, there is not enough <coughs> Uh, evidence yet or uh, uh, data on all of these things, but if current trends of an ex exponential ice mass loss rate are confirmed, then in 10 years doubling time, and that's the uh, green line here, that would lead to a one meter sea level rise by 2067 and five meters by 2090. And the five years doubling time, red line, would lead to one meter sea level rise to, by 2045 and five meters by 2057, which would be only 40 years from now. <coughs> this is uh, done by Columbia University. 
professor or associate, uh, uh, Tim Hansen, yeah, and his associate, he is from the uh, school of more uh, bold and worrisome scientists, not all scientists are agreeing uh, with, with, with his analysis, and I'm coming back to that uh, moment. Again, evidence that West Antarctic ice sheet is uh, forming faster than anywhere else on the planet. And it's forming twice as fast as previously thought. And some deniers are saying that global warming did stop in 1998. But what is happening is that most warming is going into the oceans, which is this uh, uh, blue area, and this is the uh, land and ice at, uh, atmosphere. Another issue here is the tipping points, which are the irreversible mechanisms that might trigger self-reinforcing catastrophic climate change and some say this is already a question of some years rather than decades. And scientists have uh, determined some 15 candidates for the big points. And uh, I'm showing it them here. Uh, and I'm just taking this meta, meta methane uh, outburst, per permafrost methane outburst as an example because the methane is uh, 20 to 70 times more powerful greenhouse gas than CO2. If, if melting continues and it released, you don't know what is going to happen. It's so powerful. Uh, and, and then there's other these kind of tipping points that we don't know all the uh, impact of them. Now on this, the impact of all this in the uh, uh, sea, rise of the sea level. There are two schools, schools of thoughts, which I mentioned. There are some cautious scientists who stress, to stress the lack of data and difficulties in methods. And uh, in the intergovernmental panel on climate change is a good example of that. The uh, estimates are some half, half to uh, one meters, a couple of uh, feet. So, uh, uh, in a year, 100 years times. And then there's some other scientists who are really concerned and think that the lack of data, difficulties in methods should not prevent uh, giving us some estimates for the decision making. And they see already uh, five to seven meters rise in 100 years. Which is basically in your, your children's uh, future. So, I, I mentioned James Hansen, who was the long-term head of NASA's Goddard Institute of Space Studies, a leading climate scientist at Columbia University. And he is using other climate evidence as, uh, as his, for his studies, <coughs> among other things. But he's really, really respected, grand old man of climate science. Uh, so here is CO-driven temperature increase uh, in the world, and uh, it's impact to seawater level. And here we have situation in the, on the globe some uh, 10 to 60 million years ago, it's a long time ago, and here is the present. And uh, uh, some. Uh, 40 million years ago, there was no ice sheets on the planet, and the uh, seawater level rise was 70 meters higher. And uh, some uh, 10 million, <coughs> 10 million years ago, uh, it was the time the Greenland West Antarctic ice sheet started the uh, uh, glaciation process, and the uh, the water level at the time was six to seven meters above the sea level uh, from the present. Now we are here, and the CO2 
concentration in the atmosphere are similar, starting to even be, this is an internationally accepted climate change uh, target, which we are going to reach in a couple of, well, maybe a decade or two. And that would mean that we have similar conditions, which might take some time to stabilize, that it was 10, some 10 million years ago when the sea water rise was six to seven meters higher than today. But this four Celsius is actually where we are now. We are heading towards that. We don't stop change. And that would mean that similar conditions and as 40 million years ago, it was the 70 meters sea level rise. And what this all means is, this is just the explanation of that. I mean, this, these slides are available if you are interested. The implications of this is that the official ob objective, which is the uh, Copenhagen Accord uh, of limiting warming to less than two Celsius above pre-industrial levels, is likely to produce six to seven meter sea level rise over time, wiping out cities like London, New York, Shanghai, Singapore, Tokyo, Helsinki, in their current form. So it gives you, of course, how quickly this happens. Whether it's in 100 years or 100 years or, or several hundred years. And, but anyway, current policies, if they are implemented, as we are now seeing, I like to result in a temperature increase above uh, four Celsius and produce sea level rise of 70 meters, which is, for the time, which is a catastrophic. And this is what James Hans Hansen says, Florida looking like a little bit over to the, uh, in a, in a hundred years or so. So that's uh, five meters rise, this is 18 feet, but that's, that's his, his, his opinion. This is taking one of his TED talks in Florida, where he said that this place where he's talking would be underwater. Mm -hmm. So there is also much talk, there has been much talk about adaptation to the four Celsius increase compared to pre-industrial times. And what does it mean? And I'm just taking what Hans Jan Schnellhuber, who is the director of Potsdam Institute for Climate impact uh, research, say in 2011, that what is the difference between two Celsius word and four Celsius word, it's a human civilization. And that it was saying that four Celsius temperature increase probably means a global carrying capacity below one billion people. And, and if you have seven billion right now, so where are all these six billion people going? And what happens to them? So this gives a kind of a, uh, evaluation of the magnitude of the problem. Uh, Schnellhuber is the uh, climate advisor to uh, uh, Angela Merkel, so they, they are working quite closely together. So let's go further and, uh, uh, <coughs> and talk about a little bit about increasing rate of natural catastrophe in climate as well as loss of biodiversity. So you see here that the geophysical events which are here, earthquakes, tsunamis, etc., they are pretty stable. Uh, and of course, you don't see much uh, correlation between climate change and them. And, but then meteorological events like storms or meteorological events like floods, they are increasing steadily. That's a worrisome trend. And here is the picture about biodiversity and uh, that it has <coughs> been reduced 28% from 1970 to, I guess it was 2008 and it has just increased in rate, and you see all these declining rates of, of uh, various species. 
uh, which is also worrisome. And then uh, in terms of drought and desertification, uh, there is this Palmer drought <coughs> index. And, uh, and you see the uh, red, red ones are increasing when we come from 2000 to 2030s, 2060s, 2090s. That's a prediction, of course. So that, that's also a worrisome trend. The next problem is our resources. I am hopeful well-being and economic growth have been measured by national accounts, which use cross-national product as a key measurement of growth. And I used to be in the statistical field, and was, I was also involved in the, these kind of measurements. But GDP doesn't tell about the impact of growth on the environment. In the future, so-called global ecological footprint would be the key position in my view. And it will ultimately answer the question whether our economic development is based on a Ponzi scheme in terms of its use of global resources. And here is a picture of a global footprint, which is like how much resources we will be needing uh, in order to replenish the state of environment to its present states. So are we like going beyond the limits of the globe in terms of resources? And in 1970s, we had a balance. But after that, it has gone like 50%. And uh, we could say that we, in terms of resources of the world, we need one and a half earth of worth of resources. And if this GDP growth rate, like 3.2, will continue, uh, then in uh, 2050, is this 2050, we will need four uh, resources, uh, worth of four planets of resources to be able to do that. And of course, this. This looks like something which can, cannot be sustainable in the long run. And in terms of the regional distribution, the same thing. And we see that North America uses like five globes, and this is Africa, just one one third of the globe. So these are like quotas to give it to each one. And so we in the West are really the government is here. Economic growth so, and use the climate change. And the question could be asked how could we attain this two Celsius official target, which was agreed in the Copenhagen uh, Accord, uh, the Copenhagen Climate uh, Summit? And uh, so, how could we at attain that? and continue our current economic growth and energy use as before. And uh, Ian Dunlop, uh, my old friend from the Club of Rome, I'm a member of the Club of Rome, uh, he was a uh, sales, sales group's uh, engineer and senior executive over 30 years. So see, he knows really the oil sector and, and gas and, and coal sector. But he was also a developer of the carbon emission trading system in Australia, mm -hmm. the first one, so chairman of that. So he should know about these issues, I believe. And his <coughs> thesis, which I reported in my book, Climate Sustainability, are, uh, are the following. First, the question, can global economic growth continue while we simultaneously are limiting global temperature increased to 2 Celsius. And the problem here is that with, with the current economic growth, we burn a lot of uh, fossil fuels which are producing these CO2 emissions. And, and uh, Dunlop is saying clearly no, we cannot co co continue with this global economic growth if we want to achieve this 2 Celsius. We are not running out of oil, coal, or gas resources. The issue is how to convert these resources into 
close to the market in an environmentally and economically acceptable manner or to move to al alternative energy sources. And scientists are saying that only 30-40% of current proven fossil fuel cells can be burned to have a reasonable chance, chance of remaining below two Celsius target. And, uh, and that, that is something which the oil companies have not really, they know about this issue, but they haven't really uh, gotten in, in, in grasp of that. Uh, because it's, it's going to affect the global economic growth if, if that, the implication of that is realized. The second question is, can technology help us move quickly to make the use of fossil fuels less polluting so that our economic growth model can continue? And the answer is here also no. The present technologies to make such a transition would be too expensive, environmentally damaging and time consuming. And the third question is, can the our global economic growth model continue if we quickly, quickly move to alternative energy sources of renewables and nuclear? And here again, the answer is no. Solar, wind and nuclear contribute only a very small proportion of global energy supplies relative to uh, fossil fuels. Of course, they are very important in the future in general, but they don't solve this e e equation uh, in the time frame which we are talking which we should do this. And the question here is now the question of urgency, which is the fourth problem, what we do now will determine the global development path for decades and centuries. And here I'm talking about Doomsday Book, uh, book which was which was put out by Bulletin of Atomic Scientists, and it used to be uh, to show how close we are to a nuclear catastrophe, but now they have started to put also uh, environmental holocaust uh, to their picture. <clears throat> and I'm reading this uh, 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 with uh, something which Alison Mack Marlene, who is the chair of their science and security board of this Bulletin of Atomics, said this is saying, the global community may be near a point of no return in efforts to prevent catastrophe from changes in Earth's atmosphere. The International Energy Agency projects that nonetheless societies begin building alternatives to carbon emitting energy technologies over the next five years. And now, because this was said in 2012, now it's in two years. <clears throat> the world is doomed to a warmer climate, harsher weather, drought, droughts, famine, water scarcity, rising sea levels, loss of island nations, and increase in ocean acidification. Since fossil fuel burning power plants and infrastructure built in 2012-2020 will produce energy and emissions of 40 to 50 years, the action taken in the next few years will set us on a path that will be impossible to re redirect. Even if policy leaders decide in the future to reduce reliance on carbon emitting technology, it will be too late. That's what uh, Alison McFarland was saying. And now I'm coming gradually to, uh, to what should be, should be done. And I start with trends in uh, international awareness of these issues. And uh, <clears throat> I believe the Club of Rome, I have, uh, I have the honor to be a member, was one of the first uh, started talking about these issues already in 1968. And then in 1972, they issued, or uh, FIT team issued the famous study, Limits to Growth, which was really showing at the time already that we do have limits in, the, in our use of global resources. And it was quite a lot of criticized in the 1970s and 1980s. Uh, and then it kind of was, was forgotten. 
but now nowadays it's uh, it's predictions and uh, scenarios are, are taken quite seriously. <coughs> 1972 was also the first UN conference on human environment in Stockholm. It was 130 member states present and 109 recommendations. And we have Brundtland Commission on Sustainable Development, a 1992 World Conference on Environmental Development in Rio de Janeiro, that was the first Rio. And the number of member states was grown, 176, over 100 heads of states present. Then we have 2002 World Summit on Sustainable Development in Johannesburg. 191 member states, 102 heads of state, no binding of agreements, and then we had two uh, years ago uh, one conference of sustainable development uh, in Rio de Janeiro, Rio plus 20. And again, a lot of member states, hundreds of heads of state, and uh, thousand NGOs or more. But what, they, what are the results? in terms of CO2 uh, emissions with all these 20 years, it's just decreased, increased all the time. So it's a major failure of, for the UN system where I'm coming and spent 30 years there. Uh, and hopefully now we are starting to see a little bit changes. Uh, <coughs> there was also worrisome sign in 2012 UN conference in Rio that we have, we have a move from commitments to voluntarism, uh, at least in my view, it, uh, it is a worrisome trend. And then thinking about climate change talks, we had a Rio, UN Trade Convention <coughs> on climate change was signed, then we have a Kyoto Protocol, but it was more, more like uh, for industrial countries, and we have in uh, 2009, uh, Copenhagen Accord and a number of other confer um, conferences, summits, and just uh, recently in December in Lima, Peru, and then we will have a major conference in November, December 2015 in Paris, and the question is whether we can get a major agreement at that time. So, what should be done? First, on, in terms of the Paris Agreement, then in terms of changing the UN, creating a new global paradigm of change, and then, and then mobilizing masses youth world citizens. And that's starting one with the uh, UN Climate uh, Meeting in 2015. And one <coughs> question I have been dealing with, and we are organizing a workshop on this issue in uh, Brussels uh, soon with, with all the important uh, partners is that could we learn something from the cap and trade mechanism which was used in the United States to solve the uh, acid trade, which was a big of issue in the 1980s, 1990s, and, and really cap and trade system was useful in, in that. And what we are saying here, or I'm saying, that we could <coughs> use the current and well created by oil economy and transfer that money into clean energy. And the best way would be to calculate how much CO2 we can we could still emit into atmosphere, divide that by next 50 years by a downhill curve split annual emissions as a carbon credits and let scarcity in the markets to take care of the reduction. So this is like using markets, uh, economic markets to help the change, the climate change to the right direction. And I'm skipping uh, discussions about carbon price now. Go to the next slide, which is the question of subsidies. And these days, we are heavily dependent on fossil fuels. And as I said earlier, scientists are saying that we can 
only use about 20-40% of existing known reserves in order to reach the international standard of 2 Celsius increase in global atmospheric temperature. And still, our oil companies are investing annually some 60, 600 billion dollars to buy new reserves, and the government gives fossil fuel subsidies annually over 500 billion. So there's something wrong here, because the renewable investments were last year only on the level of 250 billion, and subsidies 88 billion. And this means that the money flow into fossil energy is about three to four times bigger than into renewables. <clears throat> if we cannot change this flow in coming years, we are not able to develop a clean energy fast enough, and we could have a major economic collapse. And, uh, and, and, and we could also have this kind of a Pearl Harbor event in climate change, which will hit us, and we have panic exit from investment into fossil companies and use of fossil energy and then the kind of market values of oil companies will drop which will create the financial crisis and economic crisis in the world. So this is one scenario unless we don't do something quickly. So I have been thinking and with, with my group uh, we are working for the United States and Europe that it might not be necessarily realistic to create a global capital trade system by 2015, although we are working on it, we are trying to do it, but there should be other uh, measures take, which should be taken up at the same time. I believe the UN role should be sharpened, active scientists and scholars should be bolder and create mass movements to spread awareness the runaway climate change and urgency of action to stop it before it's too late. A new and royal role is <coughs> the following. Our <coughs> Secretary General has been quite active on climate change, but he should work together with the heads of uh, IMF and World Bank and the more bold fashion. The UN reports on these issues should be become sharper, putting out the global emergency message. message. If you read UN reports, if you don't see this, what I have been presenting, it's scattered throughout the report, so you cannot get kind of a, you, you, you don't get the understanding of the seriousness of the issue because it's not very popular to talk about this issue. And the uh, organization at the UN should establish some truly multidisciplinary policy planning capacity and global, global, global emergency unit that should be done. Now, in terms of civil, civil society and media, I believe, and my group also thinks, that we have to mobilize rock stars, movie stars, film directors, painters, and artists speak about the global emergency. And we are trying, we have done uh, one session in New York and in Europe where we bring artists uh, who are interested in the issue together with the kind of activists and, and uh, political scientists. And of course artists are idols, idols uh, for young people and and also sports, sports people. So we are working also, starting to work also with sport organizations that they could realize these, these issues and spread the message and then arrange concerts and documentaries on these issues. And, and this has been done to some extent, like Al Gore and his group have been done, but we, we haven't reached Socratic critical mass so that we could start changing what is happening on the whole in the economic systems. Uh, in my book, Crisis of Global Sustainability, I was also thinking about long-term <coughs> global governance change for the world, which would mean a global 
complete overhaul of the UN system first and then some emergency measures. Uh, and the issue here is that <clears throat> once the severity of the crisis is accepted worldwide or by the majority of governments, a second conference of the UN Charter foreseen in its Article 209 should be called for. This has been there in the UN Charter, but it has never, never been used. It was initially the idea to have a second conference, the UN Charter, but it has not been done. So this would mean that we could start a new uh, democratic process where all the countries and stakeholders could be present uh, to understand uh, the situation and uh, create some uh, new uh, organizations and bodies which would be more, more effective than uh, the present one. And one idea is of, uh, which we have had at ECOSOC, the Economic Social Council of the UN, should become as important and uh, um, politically relevant as the Security Council is right now. So uh, these days the economic power is uh, kind of divided between Washington, where's the US government, the World Bank and IMF, and then there's the ECOSOC in New York. Uh, and uh, we don't have such a thing as like a economic security council, but it could be created in an overhaul of the U.S. Charter. But anyway, this kind of conference could take a long time, and it uh, because it, 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 it could be a, its outcome would be a new governance structure for the world, and then therefore there should be some um, uh, emergency measures to complement this kind of democratic process. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> and I am uh, now addressing a few of the emergency measures. Uh, the one is the establishment of a global crisis center or 24 hour operations room to monitor the global emergency. which could be in New York and it's, uh, some kind of associate centers uh, as well also. Sir Richard Branson from Virgin Atlantic uh, Alliance has established Carbon War Room, which is a little bit similar but much uh, less ambitious concept. Uh, <clears throat> then we could have a kind of network of these crisis centers throughout the world and uh, that was something I also developed in my book. Now I'm coming to, uh, to my conclusions. The globe is soon hitting its limits, or shall I say it has done already so, at least to some extent, and the policies of governments and corporations have not changed much over the last decades. An early warning of the situation was already given some 40 years ago. This was the study I mentioned, the limits to growth, was, which was presented in the Club of Rome. And recently, people are starting to reassess uh, that and saying that its projections were largely accurate. Some scholars are pessimistic and some are hopeful, but many say that in order to really move, you need some kind of Pearl Harbor moment, uh, which is the Hitler's invasion to Poland, to really awaken the humanity to severe crisis. And uh, I believe that the youth, I guess all of you, uh, in a key position, because it's you and your children and grandchildren who are facing the, the uh, yes, yes. Study the website and uh, trying to uh, get some people hired or volunteered to, to use to put some
social media messages all around. Uh, it's something which is in the, the making. And uh, so with using social media, things can change quite quickly. Uh, it was just a bunch of few people who started this Occupy Wall Street movement uh, before the president's, uh, presidential elections, and it changed quite a lot the debate for a while, not, not very long, but still, things could change quite quickly if they start moving. But I think the, uh, we don't hear that much about the Occupy Wall Street movement anymore, but anyway, it should be really change from Occupy Wall Street to save Wall Street because the sea level rise threatens lower <laughs> as Harry and Sandy clearly demonstrate. We also need various kind of green project and networking throughout the world. And basically, finally, we need a new set of values, keeping the interest of future generations in mind. Uh, <coughs> And we need global, regional, national, and local institutions that are able to manage this crisis. Here is the uh, book I wrote on these issues. And then we, <coughs> this website is for my book. But then we have now a website which is uh, globalcrisisnow.com, which is, which is on, on this. And we are just trying to <coughs> fill it may make the message out, we might need your help uh, with, 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 uh, with your assistance. So that's all. Thank you very much. Thank you for your presentation. I think we're moving to a uh, question and answer session. And uh, I will take adva advantage to start with my question to you. Um, you spoke a lot about addressing the issues from below, from like youth and student organizations. I have a question of how, for example, like to address this question from a state to state perspective, especially when we saw from the graphs you started with, we have discrepancies how China CO, CO emissions and India CO2 emissions are rising compared to U28 and USA. But here's the question of, as if I'm speaking from China perspective, they are claiming that they are the country that is rising, developing now. And they have the right to development. They have right to do the CO2 emissions because United States and Europe have, were having the Industrial Revolution during 19th century, during, during the beginning of 20th century. So the CO2 emissions that Earth is, that USA and Europe committed during those years, 200 years ago and so on, we are dealing with this consequences, for example. So why China and India don't have the right to their CO2 emissions, for example, to reach the level of development that the United States and Europe reach now, and they have resources, for instance, to do the renewables, to do clean energy, and so on. So do, the, do countries have a right to a certain level of CO2 emissions. It's a provocative question, of course, but um, that's the claims that these countries make often. So I will start with this, and of course, then we will go to the floor. Uh, <clears throat> well, that's uh, one of the key questions in, in this equation. Uh, the world is unfair. Um, if uh, China and India take the same path as Europe and Amer Americas, we are all dead. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, or including China and, and uh, <laughs> India. So that is not really a workable situation in the long run. So uh, it's unfair, of course. And I guess that's why India and uh, China and developing countries want all kind of compensation yeah, from uh, Western countries, and they are very reluctant to give it because there's all kind of economic crisis going on and budget limitations and this and that. So <coughs> negotiations are very difficult. So uh, this is the uh, major issue, and uh, <coughs> it's very difficult to uh, uh, solve it uh, unless we are, uh, start to see that we are in the same boat. Uh, 
we just have to go together and find a solution which is kind of a, a optimizing the situation, but it's not, not easy. But do you think the compensation, the compensation version is a, is a solution, like to give a compensation to those countries, or it's more about, like you say, figuring out that we're in the same boat, so it's, it's beneficial to you to cut CO2 emissions, so you will be living in a better environment, or should it be more on a compensa compensation basis? Well, the, it seems that compensation has been a difficult issue, and uh, uh, I'm not sure if we have made that much uh, uh, progress of that. But maybe more promising is if, if in these market mechanisms, which I mentioned, uh, cap and trade system, carbon price, and all that, if we can get some kind of incentive that when we move to renewables, some uh, higher percentage of profits and uh, funds go to the developing countries. So that would be like a marketplace, market-based uh, incentive for them to join it, and, uh, and, and that, that might be maybe something which could be negotiated in, in Paris, but uh, that's a starting to think about this. Questions? Yeah. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, excuse me. I have two questions. The first one, it's on um, the shift from uh, fossil uh, energy or oil to renewable energy, such as solar energy, as you mentioned in your presentation. I was doing some reading recently, and I found out that, of course, it's not that costly to, 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 to use uh, solar energy, for instance. But one of the authors mentioned that the cost for maintenance for such infrastructure would be even higher than what we have today. Uh, so I don't know. On non renewables, you mean? Excuse me? We're on renewables. Yes, yes. And of the cost of it will be higher to maintain the infrastructure as compared to what we have, for instance, using oil and other uh, traditional way of producing energy. So I don't know what will be your intake on that. And the second question, I don't know if I can go straight to the second one. You, on mobilization, you mentioned states and civil society, but apparently you didn't touch uh, the role of multinational companies or yeah, enterprises because I uh, would assume that they are the ones who are actually involved in pollution and all these, and they are kind of higher stakeholders in the pollution process. So what role? Multinationals. Yes. Okay. So what role and place are you putting? Uh, are you giving them into addressing the issue of uh, global warming? <coughs> uh, I um, I'm, I don't know where, where you got this uh, uh, information that the co uh, the, the, that uh, the infrastructure to uh, maintain. Rim Renewables is um, higher. Uh, uh, I, I don't have that kind of information. Uh, mm, some of the kind of electricity grids and um, and uh, uh, gas station networks could be used uh, in the new kind of green economy. Uh, so um, uh, there might be big cost in terms of transition, making the changes, uh, because that that is could be quite difficult, because we are trying to run two economies at the same time. One is the old fossil fuel based economy, and one is a green economy. And the, it's, we cannot do it in a rational way, that we shut off the other one, and then we build up the other. You have to kind of use the old uh, uh, networks and grids and all that, and somehow transfer it. So it's a complicated process. So uh, maybe maybe the figures you are quoting are, are, are related related to that, that. But I don't see that it's uh, it's any any more uh, costly. And, and some of the networks. Uh, 
we are, for instance, talking about methane as a kind of new kind of fuel, and the present uh, uh, gas uh, station, gas um, kind of natural gas uh, infrastructure could be used for that. So that that is uh, evidently possible. Now, mobilization of multinational companies is uh, is a key, and uh, and I was talking about these issues to. Uh, Chairman of the Shell Corporation, one, one to one, which happens to be also Finnish, and, and he agreed. This is a problem, and uh, I, show, I showed him a uh, picture of James Hansen about Florida and the water, and he agreed. I mean, he, he has also children and grandchildren, and uh, so uh, a number of multinationals and companies, and they're, because they have a big research staff, and it's, they understand this problem. But it's very difficult for them to change the world, and the governments, and the regulations, and they need also incentives from, the, the, from governments, how to make a workable system. So that's kind of uh, uh, lacking. So they are, they are waiting uh, signals from Paris in the uh, uh, agreements that that the governments will say, now we change the world. And the, the multinationals would also uh, change. So this this is related to oil companies, so uh, probably other multinationals also start to realize this. And actually, we, <coughs> we, have, we have been also involved in the World Bank uh, carbon pricing uh, initiative, and uh, UN Secretary General had last this September a summit in New York, and there was a, kind of hundreds of big corporations who were willing to uh, uh, support the carbon pricing and a number of these kind of new initiatives. It's more like the some governments are against it because it's uh, it's not the way they see that diplomacy should be should be done. The, uh, little, the, the idea of uh, introducing markets, carbon markets, carbon pricing in these negotiations is a new, new uh, angle, new uh, initiative approach, and some countries are against it. So it's uh, because they're thinking in old ways, I would say. So this is uh, my take. Further questions? Please introduce yourself. And, uh, uh, my name is Kalakal. I'm we're doing the MA in Peace and Conflict Studies. I'm from India, so um, I was just wondering, instead of compensation, there was talk, there are stipulations in these agreements about knowledge sharing as a possible bridge gap solution. Sorry, what sharing? Knowledge sharing. Knowledge sharing? Yeah, so like I know that they started establishing wind farms and started using Western technology and producing wind energy as one way of switching to a sustainable kind of energy resource. So I was wondering what are your thoughts on that and what could be the scope of knowledge sharing as a possible solution? Like is it feasible? Can it have that much impact? And talking about carbon trading and carbon markets, does that not defeat the purpose of setting a carbon cap if they're trading in these carbon <clears throat> on on uh, uh, knowledge sharing, I, I think it's uh, this is already happening. Uh, there's a lot of structures to do, do that, uh, and then it could be improved. And I guess it will be improved. But whether that's enough in terms of uh, making uh, developing countries happy that they get enough. It, the, the usual way of thinking is that we need money, we yeah, need financial assistance. And you give it to the government, and government has full right to do whatever they want with that. Now, what I'm uh, talking a little bit is that we could have a little different system that the, that the uh, markets would be used so that 
the developing countries could get some benefits out of that. And uh, that might be a more viable way in, in, in the future. So I don't know if this answered your question. Did that answer it? Because I had a question. My name is Catherine. Um, I'm in the Global Affairs Program. Um, you mentioned wind energy. Can, can you talk a little bit about the wind energy? Is that something that, that can be more developed? Or did I misunderstand you? Maybe that there are limitations on how much such sources can be used as a solution? Um, you know, how much more can wind energy be developed? It seems that that would be, you know, a, a huge possibility. But what is going on in that area? Uh, well, I uh, I have a chart, but uh, it's not part of this lecture, and it shows the percentage of wind energy yeah. on the globe, and it. It's so tiny, it's like zero percent, <laughs> because it's uh, it's just rounded. It has to be rounded to zero, because it's so small. However, wind and solar has improved in terms of technology tremendously over the last decades, and, uh, and, and there are some uh, kind of statistics and uh, studies that uh, if they are used skillfully and uh, boldly, they could really, uh, like, I don't know what, what was the real figure, but they could produce 25 of India's uh, uh, energy production, etc. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, the issue is, I guess, yeah. in India and elsewhere is in developing countries that it's much cheaper to use coal, mm -hmm. and, uh, and it's a kind of immediate benefits are there. Mm -hmm. But then, uh, and then we see what happens in China that people are moving out from China because the air pollution is so bad. Uh, kind of uh, intelligent Gensia is is sending their children out, out from China, and that's uh, that's a kind of terrible uh, future. So uh, uh, there are. <coughs> possibilities, you use wind and uh, solar in particular, and, and some, some are saying uh, that <coughs> nuclear energy could be a kind of interim solution for the next 50 years, uh, it's not polluting, and, uh, and then it should be phased out, but of course there's this uh, storage issues, uh, that's, that's a difficult issue. Now in, in terms of uh, Wind and solar storage is a little bit kind of difficult issue because we don't have these kind kind of batteries which which are like a solar doesn't there's no sun in the in the evening mm -hmm. at night so the the, the the sun has to be storage somewhere and we don't have that kind of capacity yet to too much and wind I don't know if the wind is blowing that much in uh, in, the, in the evening or or na nights, it's also an issue. Uh, but uh, technologies are improving, so that, that certainly there's some hope there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. More questions? Could you address a little bit more on the nuclear energy aspect of it? Because like after Fukushima, I know that Germany is phasing out all its, it's closing down all its nuclear plants. So. Is that feasible and is, is it an interim stopgap solution? Is it a feasible solution even for the next 50 years? Yeah, this is a issue that it seems to be very emotional to some many people. I was talking to this kind of group and one lady was really upset that I was saying that nuclear mm -hmm. energy could be a solution. <coughs> uh, but uh, in terms of the uh, safety, this safety has improved also tremendously uh, in recent decades. Uh, 
so uh, in, in that I guess we you are coming from uh, Ukraine and it's like yeah. Chernobyl is yeah yeah, yeah. The, 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 we we could prevent these kind of things of course we shouldn't put nuclear reactors where there's kind of earthquake uh, prone area <coughs> and I guess that was in uh, Japan the case and or I don't know exactly but but that could have been the one thing uh, but otherwise it's uh, it's, a, it's a feasible and uh, there were some people some scientists some uh, politicians who think that that's the only way to go actually because it's uh, it's, uh, it's, it's not polluting and it's uh, relatively efficient, I, I understood. And uh, then it's a question what we do with this uh, uh, nuclear waste. And so that's a big issue, of course, but it's, uh, <laughs> I mean, uh, I guess it's better that we stay alive <coughs> for the next 200 years <laughs> than, than uh, let them, the, the future, future the generation think about that. Uh, but, but what is the solution? Johnny. Go ahead. Uh, so, uh, since we're talking about technology, uh, I was wondering, uh, there was a lot of talk about clean coal, yeah? Uh, and the, uh, the coal that China burns is very, very dirty compared to some of the coal found in other parts of the world with high levels of sulfur. Uh, but clean coal is supposed to have less, like the coal in the U.S. that is found in the U.S. is meant to be cleaner than that in China. So, um, so is there any truth to that? And two, uh, since we're talking about technology and, uh, and disposing of, of waste, uh, uh, there's a lot of talk about sequestration, taking the scrubbers and uh, uh, that have potential solution. And if it is, why, are, why is it not implemented as frequently as, you, as possible? Uh, uh, that's true that uh, coal has uh, different grades and some, some are very uh, clean, much cleaner than the others uh, uh, <coughs> and that the, some uh, industries and organizations are promoting that as a, as a solution but it's still emitting a lot of CO2 whether it's clean or not uh, it's, uh, it's, it's kind of bad idea to we are not saving the human race through uh, clean uh, coal. The, uh, now, the capture and storage uh, issue uh, is also, uh, in, and the technology is in, in improving. Uh, it is uh, a lot of <coughs> progress, but the the amount of industry that we would need is to really start to make a difference is so huge that I guess Ian Dunlop, who was the chairman, uh, and I think it, it, was, it was mentioned in my book, uh, they, a figure taken from <coughs> him, that we, to be effective we would need industry which would be at the same magnitude that the whole oil industry at the moment in terms of being effective in, in terms of making a real impact and how, where could we create that kind of in, industry quickly so it's it's a it's a partial solution but it's not really a solution it's, it's it helps a little bit but i guess it wouldn't be profitable otherwise it it would emerge as an industry as a viable evidently not yeah evidently it's not it would, it would it may, maybe Maybe uh, in the negotiations, some uh, incentives could be built so that it would become more and more profitable. And uh, I'm, I'm sure, almost sure that this has been thought out also. But it, 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 at the moment, it's not moving that fast forward as it should be. We have questions. Yes. Uh, what's the role of a uh, conservancy in, in your and what you propose? Um, and like I wanted to draw to like uh, what was happening in the states in the 70s as far as the amount of uh, gasoline can be purchased like, depending on the day is something like that I don't know at what scale but uh, state imposed conservancy 
be a solution or part of a solution? And then uh, what's the role of uh, natural resource preserves as far as also states or international bodies monitoring, mon like mo uh, they monitor or preserve, uh, you know, forests and stuff like that, which naturally, uh, you know, get rid of the CO2. Um, what's the role of that in, uh, in your plan? Well, I would say that it <coughs> helps, should be done, but it's not enough. Uh, I mean, th there is a kind of a <coughs> natural tendency in uh, people thinking that we, we have to recycle and uh, conserve and uh, save water and save resources, and that it's, it's all good and it's, it should be done. But we, we really need uh, the governments to act and give uh, some kind of signals uh, to the companies and markets, and and then use of course legislation in their individual countries to, to make binding decisions. But uh, it, it, it's it's also important, I think, in the psychological message that the people start to do something. You you in your own lifestyle, you you use kind of ecological principles and. Then, then you have a feeling that you're participating in the global Save the World uh, campaign. Uh, uh, although it's mi maybe minor in terms of the global emissions, but it's still something. And that should be kind of a mindset of, of all of us. Yeah, just a quick follow up. Uh, your idea on uh, having um, credit supply or certain caps. Would that be tailored specifically to multinational industry, states, or would it can it also be applied at a consumer level where as a, you know, me being a citizen here, if I use less of certain type of, um, you know, hydrocarbons or whatever, whatever kind of energy, um, this, you know, I would get a tax credit as a citizen or is it going to be more tailored towards the state or big business, um, they would receive the credits um, like the industry, they're the ones that should be tailored, you know, have these plans tailored to, or will there be different size and scale for, different, you know, for everyone participating in, in the economy? Yeah, I, th I think that <coughs> they're happy in their thinking of, uh, along these lines, that, uh, that we, we have these cap and, cap and trade systems, uh, like ca California has some, some kind of system, and some others, uh, some other states, and uh, then in China there's a kind of regional and uh, state uh, systems. Uh, it's increasing e everywhere, uh, and uh, <coughs> there might be also. I, I think uh, there's also some some systems in the cities, and uh, but it, this could be put at the consumer level in the way you describe that that uh, that. Might be an idea, also, but I don't know exactly how it would work. Thank you. Do we have any further questions? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, going back to the crisis in the global sustainability itself, as you mentioned about the UN not being uh, effective for the past uh, uh, two or three decades toward addressing this issue. Do you think the problem is at the UN or state level or that there is no clear uh, communication between different actors involved in the process of addressing the issue? Because apparently it looks like we wait uh, on the UN and whatever the UN suggests, we need to move with, but yet uh, that UN language sometimes does not really translate in a better understanding where we, we, we talk, for instance, about mm -hmm. climate change or whatever. As you mentioned earlier on, saying in the UN report, for instance, you can't see it clearly. So at what extent are we waiting uh, on the UN to give, to, to give direction on that? Well, uh, is it like human nature that, like in our health, we we have a bad habits and we smoke and drink and overeat and we don't want to do 
any change uh, unless we start some some kind of heart problems or lung problems, and then then we finally start doing. So uh, it's very hard to convince people that there are crises in the future. They need the crisis now, and it's, uh, it's, uh, <laughs> which will change their attitude. And, and of course, social media and uh, all kind of games and all these kind of uh, documentaries, movies, could, could be very good in terms of you know, changing our imagination. That if they have in a smartphone some kind of a sea level rise <laughs> scenarios that water is coming up and what should we do? And <laughs> this kind, I mean, that, that, that might be a uh, way, way to do it. Mm -hmm. UN is a very big organization. There are a um, number of agencies. And, and uh, they own have their own ambitious and uh, political cycles, etc. So it's uh, very difficult to coordinate that. And you know, it's, uh, it's it's no big big organization, uh, particularly in the political organization like the UN. So, um, what so are in the environmental politics class this semester, and this past week we were talking about individual consumption and kind of the consensus we came to as a class is that it needs to be a cultural sort of awareness and we we're talking about education from a young age teaching children about um, environmental awareness about personal consumption and I was just wondering has there been an emphasis on education for children with UNESCO or any of the other UN organs has there been a real emphasis on like drilling this into children from a young age from an educational perspective at all uh, I I have not followed what UNESCO UNESCO UNICEF they have done, but let me just tell my own experience. I I was talking exactly the, almost like <coughs> the uh, talk similar kind of talk in Port Chester in Westchester, and so the organization organization called One World. And uh, its founder, interestingly enough, is a Republican politician, uh, Joe Garvin, who is a town supervisor of Port uh, Chester, Marchmont, and some other. And uh, and he invited me to speak, and uh, he basically agreed everything that I said. But for a Republican politician, it's uh, interesting. Um, but he has also his. Uh, he, he has uh, <coughs> lived uh, in Africa and elsewhere, so he has this kind of world view. And uh, he has started in Porchester uh, kind of a school program on sustainability, sustainable schools. And they are working together with a number of schools in Mexico and Africa and Asia trying to kind of compete in the, in the schools that kind of children are competing with each other, who is the most sustainable school, etc. Mm -hmm. We are also uh, planning uh, 20th of September in uh, St. Lutheran Church, which is part of City Corp in Manhattan, <coughs> a concert and uh, and uh, uh, concert and, and that kind of talk show like this a little bit where we try to plan the music and uh, music and, and talk kind of a, uh, a new new way of thinking and the, the musicians which have uh, are doing it for us uh, have and this is a Finnish uh, cellist and pianist they have done uh, this kind of a school concert in Finland and the United States, and something like a 250, or was it, yeah, 250 students have kind of listened to a message about music, classical music particularly, and it with enormous success. And, and we are trying now to start blending this environmental message into that, uh, that concept of music changing, because music 
let's see some emotions and uh, and then maybe it can change the world. Any questions left? I think I think we're done. Thank you for your talk and, and thank you.